Welcome to the fifth week of our summer message series that we've been calling Battles of the Bible. As you know, if you've been here over the last five weeks or so, we've been exploring some of the epic military campaigns in Scripture to see what lessons we can learn about facing the challenges and the battles that we face today in our own lives. So here's what we've learned so far. Number one, God will always win, no matter the odds. Number two, the skirmishes, the battles in our lives actually strengthen us and they prepare us for doing God's will, doing his purpose. Third, we've learned that we will inevitably fall if we have internal conflicts and divisions that will lead to disaster. And most importantly, number four, Jesus Christ has already claimed the victory over the greatest battle ever against the worst of humanity's enemies, which is death itself. If you missed any of those episodes in our series, you can watch them on our website, sthillary.org. Or if you just want to relive the glory, <laughs> you can go back and watch them again. Today, we're going to be looking at a series of battles in the second century before Christ. And not many people know about these battles. They're not very familiar to most people, but almost everybody knows the great Jewish holy day that came out of these battles known as the Festival of Lights. More about that in just a minute. So our tale this week begins with the untimely death of Alexander the Great of Macedonia, who, as you probably know from your history classes, conquered the entire region of Persia, the entire Persian Empire. Well, he died in 323 BC. And after he died, his, the generals in his army started fighting over the territory that they had conquered under Alexander the Great. And after a while, they settled it all and they divided the territory among the various generals. The upshot was that for about a hundred years, Jerusalem and the tiny state of Judah was ruled by the Greek Roman family in Egypt known as the Ptolemies. And under their rule, the Jews were pretty much allowed to do what they wanted. They governed themselves, they were autonomous, except they just had to pay an annual tribute to Egypt. But then, in 198, 198 BC, the king of the Seleucid Empire, you see that area there in purple, that is the Seleucid Empire around 198 BC. That empire extended from Babylon in the west all the way to what is modern day India. And in 198 BC, the king of that Seleucid Empire, Antiochus III, also conquered the land of Palestine, where Jerusalem and the nation of Judah is. And so his kingdom extended to the west all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. Well, his son, Antiochus IV, was feeling a lot of pressure from the nations around him, from all the superpowers that surround, were surrounding him. And Palestine was a very important land because it was sort of a crossroads between, you know, Egypt on the south and other and Babylon in, in the east and a lot of the different um, areas. People would travel through there and so it was very important that the people in that area be loyal to the king. And so in order to try to impose, in order to try to build that loyalty to the Seleucid Empire, Antiochus IV imposed Greek culture on the Jewish people. And it backfired. They didn't want Greek culture. And so in 168 BC, the Jews in Jerusalem rebelled. And troops were sent in to quell the rebellion. They burned the city. They desecrated the temple. And they converted it into a pagan shrine. And after that, Jews were prohibited on the pain of death from praying together, from observing the Sabbath, 
from adhering to kosher dietary laws or conducting any type of religious rite. If they did any of that, it was illegal and they could be put to death. And soldiers roamed through the countryside to enforce the king's orders. Now one day, one of those military units came to a tiny village called Modin in the foothills of Jerusalem. And when the soldiers arrived, they set up an, an altar and they forced the Jewish priest there, Mattathias, to slaughter a pig and eat of its flesh. Now, if you know anything about the Jewish religion, you know that that would be an abomination. And so the priest, Mattathias, refused to follow those orders. And when he refused, another villager came up to the altar and he was going to do what the soldiers asked. But Mattathias, filled with fury, rushed forward and killed him along with the captain of the guard and then fled into the hills. And with that began the great revolt of the Maccabees. And there are two books in the Old Testament, First and Second Maccabees, that recount these great battles against the Seleucid Empire. Now, Mattathias and his sons organized a small band of farmers who were going to rebel against all this. In the beginning, they only had something like 50 able-bodied men <laughs> with no military training whatsoever. But they took up arms with homemade weapons and various farm tools, and they trained for almost a year. When Mattathias died, he appointed his son, Judah Maccabee, Judah Maccabee, to take command of the rebellion. By that time, the rebel force had grown to about se uh, several hundred men. And they would go around and strike at night using guerrilla tactics that surprised the Seleucid troops because they were only used to conventional fighting. They didn't understand guerrilla warfare. And so little by little, with these small attacks here and there, entire areas of the countryside eventually came under control of the rebels. Well, finally, the governor of the region, Apollonius, decided he needed to take some serious action. And so he came into the area with 2,000 highly trained mercenary soldiers. Now remember, the Jewish rebels only had about 200 untrained men versus 2,000 highly trained soldiers. And so the only advantage that the tiny Jewish force had was the element of surprise and the rugged terrain that was inhospitable to large troop movements. And so one late afternoon when the enemy troops were passing through a narrow gorge, Judah knew that the moment to attack had finally come. And he divided his forces into four units. The first unit cut the soldiers off at the pass so they couldn't keep moving forward. At the same time, the second unit came in behind them and hemmed them in in this narrow gorge. And then, almost immediately, from the eastern mountainside came swooping down uh, the third unit. And they attacked the Seleucids by flanking them from the east. And when they turned to fight, just then, the fourth unit came down behind them and assaulted them from the rear. The Seleucid troops were completely destroyed, and all their weapons and their equipment were taken as loot. Judah and his men became national heroes overnight, and many volunteers rushed to join the uprising. But that's not the end of the story. Antiochus realized that he had a serious problem on his hands. And so he undertook a major military campaign to restore law and order to the region. He doubled the number of troops and he sent in 4,000 men along the coastal road and then up into the mountains surrounding Jerusalem. But Judah had lookouts and they were hidden among the rocks and the olive trees and they watched as the troops advanced slowly up the mountainside to a place called the Beth Haran Pass. The column of men that were marching was over a mile long, if you can imagine that. 
And when the formation passed into a narrow canyon, they hadn't learned much from the first fight, when they passed into a narrow canyon, Judah's men once again charged. They cut down the front line and they killed the leader of the battalion. Well, panic ensued among the enemy and the men broke ranks and they fled. And so Judah was once again victorious and his prestige rose and his army ballooned to around 6,000 men. The rebellion was growing. Well, now Antiochus was hopping mad. You can only imagine. He enlisted a member of the royal family, Lysias, to take up the cause. And his orders were to destroy the rebel forces by any and all means possible. Here's what it says in the Bible. He was told to crush and destroy the power of Israel and the remnant of Jerusalem and wipe out their memory from the land. He was no longer playing. So Judah faced 20,000 foot soldiers and 4,000 cavalry who had camped at a place called Emmaus, which was about seven miles northwest of Jerusalem. And the general's name who led the enemy troops was Georgius. Well, he decided that he was going to try something new. He wanted to give Judah a taste of his own medicine. And so he tried a surprise attack at night. He took 5,000 men and he went to the nearby Jewish camp in the darkness. But Judah had already gotten wind of the plan. So he moved his men up into the hills, leaving only a small decoy force behind. And he ordered that bonfires be lit in the camp to make it look like that it, it was inhabited. But when Georges attacked, guess what? He found it deserted. Well, he was really angry, and he saw the decoy force going up the mountain as planned. And so he followed them out of anger. And guess what he encountered up in the mountains? The other 6,000 men who wiped them out and ambushed them. Judah then moved on to the Seleucid camp at Emmaus. He crushed about 5,000 men there and took the whole camp um, by storm and set it on fire. Once again, the enemy retreated in humiliation. After one last failed attempt to capture Jerusalem, Judah finally declared victory. He went to Jerusalem. He cleansed the temple of its defilement and he rededicated it to God in 164 BC. And as he was doing that, a great miracle happened. He was in the temple and he was going to light the large menorah in the temple but he could only find a single cruise of oil. It was all he had, so he used it. He thought it would only last a day, but the oil actually burned for eight full days. It was a miracle. And so was born the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah that is still celebrated today. The Jewish people had achieved religious freedom there were more battles after that for about another 20 years, but they finally won their political independence as well. Through their valiant and persistent efforts, Judah Maccabee and his brothers heroically defeated their oppressors and he cleared the land of evil. So what is the lesson for us in all that? Well, sometimes you and I face evil in our lives. It can come in various forms. Sometimes it could be a supervisor at work who has it out for you because you just naturally outshine him or her. It might be an intractable neighbor who wants to fight endlessly over lot lines or tree heights. It could be rejection by people whose only goal in life seems to be to hurt you. It could be public humiliation motivated by jealousy and false accusations. 
whatever it is, you and I will face evil in our lives from time to time. And if there's anything that the great battles of Judah and his brothers can teach us, is that we can defeat evil with God's help and through our own ingenuity and perseverance and passion. Three ordinary farmers assembled a ragtag group of rebels that cast off a mighty military organization. They were fighting for nothing less than their religion and their culture, and for them it was worth fighting for. And their success demonstrates that the great cosmic battle between good and evil is won in the daily struggle of ordinary people living their best lives. In fact, ordinary people have done remarkable things to improve this world and to drive out evil throughout history. The prophet Amos, in the first reading, was an ordinary guy. He wasn't a professional prophet. He lived in the southern kingdom of Israel, but God called him to travel to the northern kingdom and to prophesy there to warn the people of their idolatry and their injustice. And when the priest of the temple came out and he accused Amos of being a professional prophet just looking for some money or a handout and told him to go home, look at what Amos said. He said, I was no prophet. I was a shepherd and a dresser of sycamores. In other words, Amos was an ordinary man who went up to the kingdom of Israel to drive out evil. The 12 apostles that we hear in the gospel reading today, they were also ordinary. Most of them were just fishermen. And yet Jesus sent them out on the most important task of all. It was a spiritual battle to cleanse the land of evil. The gospel says that Jesus summoned the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. And through their own bravery in taking no provisions with them, through their perseverance when they were not welcomed in many towns, and through their passion for preaching the gospel, they were able to drive out many demons. Brothers and sisters, In Christ, you and I have every weapon we need to cast out evil and to clear the land from its negative influence. And that's because we have been given, as the second reading says, every spiritual blessing in the heavens. In fact, St. Paul says we've been given seven blessings That's what that second reading, it's very complicated to follow. It's a lot of words. But basically, Paul is saying that we have been given seven perfect blessings. We have been chosen and called by God for his purposes. We have been adopted into the family of God. We have received his grace and his favor because we have been redeemed. The mystery of God's will has been revealed to us. We have already received an inheritance, that's the sixth gift, an inheritance as God's children that guarantees our place with him and gives us hope. And the seventh gift is the Holy Spirit, which marks and protects us as God's own possession. Through these spiritual blessings, and our own determination and passion and perseverance, you and I are sent into the world like the apostles to overcome evil by living our best lives. What does that mean? It means being holy and without blemish before God. Evil and evil people exist everywhere. And you will face them at some point in your life if you haven't already. Perhaps they threaten you somehow right now at this very moment. But take heart. Because like the courageous apostles, 
like the fiery prophet Amos, like the zealous Maccabees, Christ has already strengthened you for the battle.